Yeah, so I joined Boris Thompson Institute in 2002, just as Alan Renwick, who many of you knew, was retiring. Alan very much wanted to be here for this celebration, but unfortunately, sadly, passed away earlier this week. But when I came to BTI, I was brand new out of a postdoc, I'd, which is, means I was woefully unprepared to run a lab. But fortunately, I shared lab space with Alan for about six months, and he was really a great friend and mentor and really helped to guide me as I was getting started running my lab in, in chemical ecology. And of course, then I also inherited all his equipment, which was a great way to start a lab. Um, my lab does research on natural products in plants, and I'd like to convince you that studying plant-insect interactions, chemicals that plants use to defend themselves against insects, are also now important for human drugs and human health. Here on this next slide, I have shown four plants, which seem a bit disparate. We have um, foxglove, squill, wallflower, milkweed. All of these plants have one thing in common, is that they all produce these compounds called cardiac glycosides, which are used in human medicine. You can buy them here in pill form. They're used to treat congestive heart failure. The other thing that all four of these plant species have in common is that they were all independently used by different human cultures to treat heart disease in sort of an ethnobotanical way. So natives in Europe used foxglove, natives in North Africa used squill, in China they used wallflower, and here in North America they were using milkweed as an ethnobotanical treatment for heart disease. All of these plants independently involved the biosynthesis of cardiac glycosides, completely unrelated plants, independently came up with very similar compounds, and obviously not as a treatment for heart disease, but to keep from eat, eaten by insects. So all of these plants are very resistant to insect herbivory, with the exception of things like the monarch butterfly here, which is able to feed on milkweed because it's very resistant to cardiac glycosides. And so this is an insect defensive chemical, which is also used as a human drug. And if you look sort of historically among chemicals that we use in human medicine, about half of them are either you know, plant defensive chemicals, have natural functions in plants, or are derived from natural plant chemicals. What's also interesting is that although we know the structure of these chemicals, in many cases, we don't know how these plants are making them. And so that's really what my lab is focused on, is figuring out how plants make these defensive chemicals, some of which are then also important for human medicine. So the idea is that by understanding how the plants are defending themselves against insects, we can develop new methods for pest control, but also maybe new methods for generating new medicines that could be involved for human health benefits. So about five years ago, I decided it would be interesting to try to figure out how plants make cardiac glycosides. And the plant that I decided to work on is here shown the wallflower. And so the question was, how do I find wallflowers? And so fortunately, Alan Renwick was still around. And I knew that 25 years ago, in the early 1990s, Alan's lab had been studying wallflowers, specifically looking at the chemical ecology of plant defense against insects. And so I asked Alan, so where did you find your wallflowers? And he said, next to BB Lake. <laughs> and sure enough, I went to that spot next to BB Lake, and here are the wallflowers still growing next to BB Lake. And so I decided to, you know, 25 years later, basically continue Alan's research, but rather than focusing on plant-insect interactions, focusing on how do these wallflowers now actually produce the biochemical, these cardiac glycosides that are using for, they're using for defense. And in the last five years or so, we found eight genes involved here in the biosynthesis of this compound called digoxin, which is found in wallflowers. And we think we have pretty much the entire biosynthetic pathway of cardiac glycosides worked out now. We could now put this into yeast or some other plant, um, sort of model organism to make cardiac glycosides. And note here that I say cardiac glycosides so this digoxin here is an example of one of 100 different cardiac glycosides that are found in wallflowers. And now that we're able to clone these genes, we have the biosynthetic pathway, we can start tweaking the pathway and purifying different kinds of compounds and looking for different kinds of medical compounds that might be relevant for human medicine. If you do a PubMed search for cardiac glycosides these days, 
You do find papers about treatment for heart disease, but actually most of it relates to treatment of cancer, that these compounds are also now inhibitory of cancer cells. And the, we think that by expanding from, let's say, one compound here that's being currently used commercially, if we have 100 different kinds of cardiac glycosides, maybe we can tweak better uh, treatments for cancer or heart disease in, in human medicine. So this is only one example. If you look at what's out there in plants, you know, there's thousands and thousands of different metabolites in plants. And what our research really is doing is sort of paving the way to find new chemical pesticides like cardiac glycosides, but also then new biosynthesis of human medicines. And if you look at any typical plant leaf, this is a tobacco plant here, there's a few thousand small molecules. And the majority of these molecules in plants are completely unknown. Let's say a leaf like this has 5,000 molecules. 500 of these might be known, primarily things like sugars and amino acids and lipids, things that make a plant a plant. And the other 4,500 are involved in defense. And that's really the interesting part of the plant. And what makes one plant different from another plant is these chemical differences. And what we have here is tobacco. This is Hong Ming Fang, who's a um, former postdoc in my lab who is studying tobacco. He's now a faculty member at Louisiana State University. And he was studying tobacco here in my lab and looking at two compounds particularly. These are acyl sugars here, and this is probably one you've heard of. This is nicotine. Both of these are insect defensive compounds, and studying these compounds now also has practical applications. So we just this week had a visitor here from Enza Zaden, which is a um, Dutch vegetable seed company. And they were telling us now that they've been breeding tomatoes to produce more of these acyl sugars to have higher resistance to aphid and whiteflies. And that's only possible because of research that's been done on the biosynthesis of acyl sugars, primarily by Rob Last, who you saw in the video earlier this morning, who have figured out the biosynthetic pathway of acyl sugars now enabled the breeding of tomatoes, breeding in genes from wild tomatoes to produce acyl sugars and cultivated tomatoes and make them more resistant. Uh, we were also looking at here nicotine, which is a well-known drug. But surprisingly, despite the fact that people have been using nicotine for thousands of years, we still don't completely know how plants make nicotine and also how plants break down nicotine. So we've been looking for genes involved in both nicotine synthesis and nicotine breakdown, which again has practical applications in human-plant interactions. And so most of these plant metabolites function in plant defense. Most of them are unknown. And I would argue that even studying ordinary plants, plants like you see every day, has vast opportunities for new discovery of new molecules involved in defense and possible also human uh, applications. You don't have to go to the Amazon to look for exotic plants. Any plant out here in Ithaca probably has compounds that nobody's ever heard of, compounds that we can figure out how they're made by the plant, and compounds that have pro possible practical applications, both in plant defense and in human medicine. And so in summary then, what we say is by studying plant defenses, we can get new ideas for looking at crop protection and new ideas for developing new pharmaceutical compounds. And finally, most of this research in my lab is not being done by me. And I'd like to just finally acknowledge the people who are currently in my lab who are working on various aspects of plant uh, biochemical interactions. We've got Fu Min Wang, Tara Alvarado Paro, Leila Faiz, Allison Norton, Annette Richter, and Kevin Ahern, all of whom are currently working in my lab. And with that, do we have time for a few questions, Aaron? Absolutely. Yeah. No questions? Yep. Paul? Yep. Well, it targets a specific enzyme, a, a, a membrane cation um, antiporter, and that's found in all animal cells. But clearly, there are differences between insects and animals. And so we had found one paper from the 1960s where they were looking at toxicity in cats and which ones are more toxic to cats and less toxic to cats. 
and we did those same experiments with caterpillars, and it was very different. So having a diversity of cardiac glycosides you know, protects, now cats probably wouldn't be eating this, let's say mammals and caterpillars, right, eating the same plant. So that probably explains why they have the same theme, but you know, tweaks here, methyl group and hydroxy group to target different herbivores that might be eating these plants. And that's why we think you know, by looking at a diverse set of these molecules, we can find different effects also on human metabolism. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, the question is, how does a plant just suddenly decide to make a new chemical, right? And what is thought to happen is what they call gene duplication and neo-functionalization. So a gene duplicates and then gets a new function. And so you heard auxin mentioned earlier in this morning. And so there was a gene for auxin biosynthesis in our wallflowers that got duplicated and gained a new function and is involved in cardiac glycoside biosynthesis. So we can see in other plants there's one gene, in the wallflowers there's two genes, and one copy now has an entirely different function. No longer auxin, but cardiac glycosides. Yeah, so the, the question is, what's the natural function? It's absolutely the defense. You, here you have a compound that's toxic to essentially all animals. There's no target for this compound in plants, so it's sort of you know, an excellent way to kill animals that are trying to eat you. Not it does kill humans. I mean, obviously milkweed is toxic, foxglove is toxic, and so yes. Yeah. And, uh, Um, um, the monarch butterfly sequesters, so that's why monarch butterflies are toxic, and they have what's called target site resistance. So this enzyme that's being targeted by the cardiac glycosides is mutated in the monarch butterflies, and therefore they're resistant. And this is also a very interesting example of convergent evolution. So monarch butterflies, milkweed bugs, milkweed beetles, and milkweed aphids all independently came up with the same mutation to make themselves resistant to cardiac glycosides. So four different orders of insects, the same mutation. We should probably continue for the, thank you.